Welcome to the Fustel Fit Podcast with your host, Nicola Fustel. Straight talking, body positive coach and personal trainer. Nicola brings you your weekly guide to finding real health and fitness and to live the life you deserve. For Fitness Show, this is Nicola Fustel and I have a special guest in today, Mark Lotsu. Welcome. Hi Nicola, thanks for having me. You are welcome. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. I was just saying to Mark off air that uh, Mark's somebody I haven't met before. We actually met on Facebook and so it's exciting getting to know somebody for the first time and doing it live so everyone else can hear as well. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind Mark, can you just dive into, give us a bit of an introduction about yourself, who you are and what you do? So um, I'm Mark Lossi, as, as you've said Nicola obviously, and I, um, I've got various jobs. So I'm a private tutor massage therapist got a health and wellness business and i'm a regular youtuber daily youtuber um but my background is in teaching and i was teaching for 16 years so that's where i started really on the job front mm -hmm. and then how did you go from teaching into what you're doing now very interesting story so basically i worked in the state sector for 10 years and then moved over to the private sector and worked at a private school ended up being head of biology at the private school and then whilst I was there there was um, I don't know if you know but there, in, in schools there, there can be a culture of giving kids more help than they're supposed to do with the coursework and this is what I did um, and you know I take full responsibility for my actions and for what I did but as a result of that um, it was then discovered by the exam board and I got banned from teaching for three years um, and it was it was a really tough time. I know you've spoken before about uh, mental health. Yeah. And that was probably one of my darkest times. This is really full on for the first few minutes of <laughs> interview, isn't it? <laughs> um, and it was one of my darkest times. But looking back, I'm glad to be out of the environment. Um, it is very stressful. Being a teacher in a school is a very stressful environment. There's a lot of pressure that's put on you from a whole range of different sources. And for me, it was, it all became too much and I, I feel like I perhaps just lost myself. Completely unrelated to the teaching, but um, ultimately really helping to, helping me to find myself was, a few months before I'd heard about this guy called Tony Robbins. And it was from my sister's husband and he said, oh, you should read this book called Money Master the Game. So I read the book and I thought, this guy sounds all right. Watched some stuff on YouTube, thought he seems quite cool. And then I ended up going to a Tony Robbins seminar the day after I, I received the ban from teaching. So I was sitting um, in this seminar and one of the first few things that Tony said to everybody was, your worst day is usually going to end up being your best day. So when you feel like you're at the lowest point in your life, when you feel like things cannot go any um, worse for you, then that's, that's going to be a massive turning point for you. And because of that turning point, you make changes in your life and your life hopefully then goes in a more positive direction. So I became a, t a little bit of a Tony Robbins junkie. Um, I did. As am I. <laughs> <laughs> I did UPW over here. Then I went to Australia to do date with bear in mind i had zero jobs so I, I i worked at a private school i lived there all my food taken care of no travel costs i lost everything um having no money i then just became slightly obsessed with tony did um upw here went to australia did date with destiny then came back over here and did business mastery so these are his seminars aren't they yes yeah, so they like the three yeah. day so immersion training so, yeah so they're the full full on um you just go three three or five days and he just hits you full days, as in you're looking at eight, nine o'clock in the morning through till whenever he finishes. So in some cases, that can be one, two the following morning and then back up the next day for it. So it's, um, it's, it's a full immersion, looking at yourself, looking at your relationship with yourself, with other people, your business life, your mental health, your financial health. He goes through the whole job lot to try and um, get you to really find what's best for you. So they're quite powerful, life-changing experiences, aren't they? But do you feel like, obviously, that Tony's very popular. There's lots and lots of people. I don't know how many hundreds go to these seminars, but do you get, like, the one-to-one -one that you really need? So when I went to UPW, I think there was about 8,000 people there. Wow. Um, and, you know, throughout the course of the event, Tony will speak to people. He'll 
he'll normally ask ask people questions anybody have any tough relationships with a loved one or is any, anybody who's you know feeling suicidal is one of the things he talks about in Day With Destiny and then people put their hands up and then he will come and have a, that one to one with them at that point in time I didn't get a one to one but the interesting thing is when you're at the seminars Tony's talking to one person but he's really talking to everybody if that makes sense yep. so the words he he's using really have the same effect on everybody as, as they do mm -hmm. for that one person in terms yep. of looking at yourself and looking at your relationships yeah so what was your biggest take home from the Tony Robbins experiences <sighs> where to begin so um, my probably the biggest event for me was Day with Destiny in um, Australia that was on the Gold Coast and every day there was some something huge that really shifted my the way I thought about things so um, one day it was uh, my perception of my mum and my parents it it's how I feel like they've um you know when people feel they can feel resentful towards their parents because of not having things when they were a kid or um not feeling like they'd done done the things that they wanted them to do mm -hmm. and you kind of harbor that within yourself and for me I, I he just made me realize how much I, my mother my mum had actually done for me and how much I really appreciated having her in my life there was um, forgiveness for myself. There was uh, there was a big impact when he talked about suicide and mental health because clearly, from what I'd been through, I'd I'd suffered quite a lot with um, with trying to come to terms with why why I should be here, why um, what was my purpose? You know, after after doing something like that, I kind of felt like I didn't deserve to live and having that experience with him um in australia was just really groundbreaking for me um the fight there was one about finances which i'm still working on <laughs> that's still a work in progress and then about relationships with other people so predominantly love and and relationships with with boyfriends girlfriends um that was also quite a big one so i'd say probably the biggest take home for me would be when he talked about suicide and just how much that affected me and I think how much it affects people that that have those thoughts that kind of feel like feel like they're on their own because they feel like you feel like you're the only person that has those thoughts you're only you're the only person that it goes through it but there's so many people that do and being in a massive room with thousands of other people just brings it all home to you yeah do you really get out your comfort zone then yeah massively so yeah so going to UPW first of all and you get there and everybody gets up and starts dancing and then everybody's just hugging just strangers are just hugging each other and you just kind of think especially being British you're thinking this is very um, uncouth behaviour you wouldn't expect this mm -hmm. and then by the but by the time you get to the end of it you've just got some really close friends there that, that you go through such a huge experience and there's activities that go on so at UPW one of the things he does is fire walking what is UPW? UPW stands for Unleash the Power Within. So it's This is the one that he has on Netflix, isn't it? There's a Oh yes, yes. A video of like behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's his video on Netflix. And so that's based around him um helping you to access your inner power, your inner drive, your inner motivation to make the changes in your life that you want to make. And so then you normally he normally has these events and at the events you do certain activities so one of the things you do at UPW is you do a, what's called a firewalk where you're walking across these burning hot um, wooden embers and I got this year I got the privilege to go back as a crew and I worked on the um, fire pit so they just have these huge huge um, it's, it's like a bonfire effectively and they burn it down over the course of the entire day so you're looking at about 12 hours worth of just burning these huge chunks of wood to form these embers and then they're laid out in these 10 meter um, long tracks and then you have you know seven eight thousand people walking over them and conquering their fear whilst they walk over them what's that like for the first time it's scary um it's scary and i and when i did it last year i was standing close to um close to the back of the queue so you kind of have that feeling you know when someone else does something before you and you think all right well if they can do it then i can do it yeah 
Yeah. Or if there's someone behind you and you think, I can't stop now because there's another <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the next one's coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've got to keep going, got to keep going. <laughs> so for me, it was, it, was, it was scary and it's intimidating when you're looking at these burning embers and you're thinking to yourself, these are actually really, really hot and these actually could do damage to me. Um, but... Is there like a trick to the walk? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, so, it's, funnily enough, so, you know, I do these YouTube videos. Yeah. I've just did one the other day called, um, about something called the Leiden Frost Effect. And it's basically when you take a drop of water and you put it onto an a oven pan and it goes into a little bubble and skims around. And then what happens is, as soon as the water hits the hot pan, a part of it vaporises, turns into to steam, but then that protects the rest of the water from boiling away too quickly. The same thing happens in a fire walk. So you have your, your feet may be sweaty or you may be wet from um, walking on the ground beforehand, and then as soon as you start stepping on the hot embers, then this water turns instantly to steam, and that helps to insulate and protect your foot from being burnt. So there is a trick in that sense, but in terms of what he's telling you to do, it's just you just walk in with purpose and you have this drive mm. and you have this motivation to just walk across as quickly as you can. So there is science behind it. There is science behind it. You don't have to it. like sign your life away. No, you? no, it's not, it's not like a 10% <laughs> of people will burn their feet no matter what happens. There is science behind it, yeah. But Amazing. So it's just the, the getting out of your own head, really. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely getting out of your own head. It's definitely... I'd love to do that. You, sh you should. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really good. And it's one of those things where Can you kind of think... Can we replicate that somewhere on Hayes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. With the scientists some, in the house to make sure we're safe. <laughs> let's get some matches. We can make, light the carpet or something like that. That could work. So that was your biggest take home. But then after the experiences, how did you then start making changes in your life, taking action? That's a great question. So um, it's... I feel like I probably just went so full on in terms of I did one seminar and then another and then another and then another and really I, I feel like I should have probably gone to one seminar. I'm gonna have to actually um, come back to that question because okay. it's time for the break already. Oh. So I'll be right back after this. Love Haze FM, we all love our new mobile app. Listen on the move, catch your favourite presenters, message the studio, request tracks, and keep up to date with the news feed. It's available to download for free from either the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Haze FM. Have you seen that change for life? It's about the little changes we can all make to be healthier. They're simple things like learning to watch the salt. You see, salt's really crafty. It hides in food you'd never expect, like cereals, bread and ready meals. It soon adds up and can increase our blood pressure, which can lead to heart disease or a stroke. That's why it's really important for us to cut down. Just check the labels. It's easy to be food smart. For more ideas to help you and your family watch the salt, search Change for Life online. Advertising on 91.8 Hayes FM could be the most cost-effective way to reach thousands of listeners every day. We can offer spot advertising or show sponsorship. So why not get your local radio station working for your business? Call our helpful team on 0208 099 2226 or email office at hazefm.org. Brilliant, I've finally quit. I feel like I've got my life back. I felt much happier. It's an amazing feeling when you stop smoking. Experience it for yourself with help from NHS Smoke Free. A range of support tools, which includes face-to-face -face guidance from advisors, helps maximise your chances of success. Go online now and search for Smoke Free. Welcome back to 91.8 Hayes FM. So I'm here with Mark Lotzer and we were just talking about walking on fire at the Tony Robbins experience. So Mark, let's dive back into those questions then. Do you want to tell us what happened after your Tony Robbins experiences? How did you take action and start changing your life? Well, Nicola, it was... It's, it's interesting because, as I said, it, I kind of feel like you go straight into um, one to the other to the other and you get given lots of information. You get given these booklets, you get given material. There's so much stuff that you can look up and dive into and there are things you can do every single day. But that takes you being motivated and you being consistent. And I think one of the big problems is that the majority of people that go to these events will come away and then they won't implement anything into their lives. So for me, I had to try to find a balance. So, so I was in a position where I was working for someone else. I was in full-time employment and I left full-time employment. I went straight to Tony Robbins 
and between full-time employment and coming out of Tony Robbins I just I hadn't had a break so it was almost like initially I just needed to take some time to myself just to process everything that had happened to me mm -hmm. and the full emotional effect of of being banned from teaching and then subsequently full emotional effect of, of diving into this this Tony Robbins experience and he talks a lot about meditation he talks a lot about reading he talks a lot about um, incantations and he says how effective these can be what's incantations so an incant so you know what an affirmation is yeah where you yeah. like I am strong I'm strong I'm strong an incantation is you you're really saying it you're moving your body you've got the you're putting volume and you're putting tonality into your voice so you're really feeling it so instead of just this simply is saying, where he's like pumps his arms in the air yeah yeah <laughs> so this is yeah so you pump get his arms physiological yeah. changes at the same time exactly yeah you're changing your physiology and then that's going to change your emotional state as well so you you're physically changing so you're moving around mm -hmm. physiology changes and then your emotional state changes as a result of those two things and then when you say the incantation it helps to embed it more into you as a person and helps to really cement it so i found that i found these things were brilliant and i found these things were fantastic but it's very easy to slip back into old ways of of thinking and old ways of behaving so i think probably the biggest thing for me is being around people and being immersed in videos and audios and books which help me to to kind of relive the the experience so i may say right i'm gonna, I'm gonna meditate every single day for the next six months and then after two weeks you know you go out and maybe get to bed late and you wake up next morning you're feeling quite tired and then suddenly you've got to go and see friends and you don't have time to meditate and you think oh, i'll do it twice tomorrow and then it just builds up and builds up and builds up and you don't you don't find the time so what I find is I, I have I give myself a period of time where I'll say if I've got an hour then I can do 10 minutes meditation I could do 20 minutes of reading I can do a little bit of exercise if I don't have time to go to the gym but if I've only got a few minutes then I, I've, I'm more than happy to just sit quietly take some deep breaths focus on my breathing just relax myself calm myself center myself before I then go on with the day which still in, which still uses everything that's that's been taught but you just simply tailor it to how much time you have and in terms of incantations that's normally when i'm in the car normally if i'm in the shower um then and i i feel the need um to say some incantations and i'll say those incantations before i go to anywhere um before i go to do presentations or i go to do anything which perhaps i could be a bit nervous about i will then perform some incantations there and they will be based on what is i'm doing and initially it sounds really it sounds really silly really can you just imagine saying i'm strong i'm confident i'm strong i'm confident just louder and louder just with more and more emphasis over and over and over and over again if you said that if you said that to someone who's perhaps not in the world of personal development they'd look at you like you're crazy mm -hmm. and i've had friends i've had friends that have looked at me like they're crazy mm -hmm. but then they try these things and after they try these things they feel that actually works and it's effective so it's a case of trying something new and seeing how that seeing how that makes you feel like this it's impossible for you to be able to say these things without feeling a change in yourself i think that's important what you said there about your friends because i think sometimes when you take on this journey of personal development you're it's as if you're climbing a ladder i see it and sometimes when you climb that ladder people who are around you right now are not willing to climb with you so then you end up leaving them behind but then as you're climbing new people will be attracted into your life and you'll meet the like-minded people like you'll go to these seminars and you'll meet people who are there for similar reasons to you and you can just keep each other topped up and the more that you do these things the more you attract the same type of people and the other people may try it and may come along and the ones that don't they just stay where they are and just carry on with their life because you're changing and you're sometimes changing to be a part which is not necessarily a bad thing yeah no that's very true it's 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 very interesting the people you meet and how you then perceive the friends you have had and the friends you've you've had from from your past lives if you like but in terms of when you were younger and the friends you've grown up with mm -hmm. and some of those friends will want to grow with you some of those friends will want don't want to grow with you and will respect you for for what you're doing and some of those friends may poo poo you and and i think that um over time you do build new friendships and you do not necessarily cut people out of your life just spend less time with people that 
aren't a positive influence on your life. And I think that's a really, really good thing to do. And I think a lot of people who go through the world of personal development, you see them, you know, they, they say they spent years doing it and they've got that one friend or that one family member who's always really negative and they just can't seem to distance themselves from them. And it's, it's like an anchor, like an emotional anchor pulling you back, so holding you from, from you being able to grow and from you being able to be who you truly are. But I think the biggest thing is um, when you have these people around you who you feel are negative and you believe that they're making you feel a certain way, so it's taking ownership of your own emotions and knowing that actually you're allowing them to do that. That person is doing whatever they're doing, that's how they're seeing the world and that's how they're living in the world. But if you don't want to have that feeling, that's down to you. Yeah, I, I do, I remember. And you can't change other people, you can only change <laughs> <Yeah>. yourself. <laughs> I love that quote. I, I really remember speaking to somebody, it was a date with Destiny, and, um, and I said to them, oh, such and such, um, just makes me really angry. And they said, no, they don't. And I was like, no, they do. They make me really angry. And they said, no, you make you really angry. I was like, I, no, I, I'm not doing anything to make me angry. Like, they're making... And they said, no, it's how, you, it's how you respond. It's how you perceive their behaviour. And, and it's your response to their behaviour. That's, that's what the anger is. Yeah. What they're doing is not making you angry because, you know, somebody may, may hate people that don't screw the lids on, onto um, tops of, of drinks properly. And so, if you're a constantly a person that has, leaves the lid off or doesn't screw on properly, and they could get really upset by that, but for other people, it doesn't, that makes no difference to them. So it's not at all what their behaviour is, it's how you perceive their behaviour and how you let that behaviour influence you, which is such, which is easy for us to say and very easy to discuss, but so incredibly difficult to actually, to actually master and to actually control and to be able to step back from a situation, one thing that I've, I feel like I'm getting better at is being able to step back from a situation and whilst you're in that situation, you look at it objectively, if you like. You, you take the emotion out of it. So you have an interaction with someone and they've upset you or annoyed you and you are able to perhaps... I, it's weird, so there's a, a, a really good coach um, called Ryan and I spoke to him about this and it's, it's about dealing with fear as well. It's about being able to see yourself in a situation but you being able to step back from it. Dissociate. Yeah, completely yeah. dissociate. That's the word I was Let's looking for. Let's come back dissociate. to this because we've got the local news now. So, Welcome back to 91.8 Hayes FM. This is the Fustal Fit Health and Fitness Show. I'm Nicola Fustal and today I have Mark Lotsu talking about personal development. So next on the story of Mark Lotsu, <laughs> <laughs> you've done the Tony Robbins <laughs> seminars and you've taken action in your life. Tell us how you got into health and wellness. So from, so from Tony Robbins, I was kind of looking for something else to do. I, I, I was doing private tutoring and I will always do private tutoring after teaching for so long. It's, it's kind of ingrained in your brain. Um, so that's something I will always do and always love doing, but I wanted another string to my bow as it were. And I had friends and family who were um, massage therapists, who are massage therapists. And so they said to me, look, you should do massage, it's really good, it's really enjoyable, um, and you'll really love it. So I thought, well, why not? So I, I um, applied for a course to do Swedish massage, which was, it's five days, so it's spread over about three months. And I found it, found it really good, but I found it quite... Um, I thought it was going to be quite tiring simply because you're using your hands a lot and mm -hmm. you know you hear about massage therapists who get arthritis or who who have problems with their joints um problems with their strength later in life and that was always something I was slightly worried about so I did the did the course and um, practical side was fine the non-practical side was the exam and that was all based around biology so that was quite um quite easy for me to to kind of get to grips with um, and I, I feel like it was a good complement to the biology teaching I already had. So I completed that course and then I started training um, as a massage therapist and then I'd heard about you know lot different massage techniques and one of them I wanted to do was deep tissue massage because I just joined a company called Urban Massage and they said most of their clients want deep tissue massage so I then um, went on a course of deep tissue mass massage 
went up north to do that course it was a very long day but it was really good fun and what i learned on that course completely changed my perception of massage so instead of just using um your fingers it's more about using your palms using your fists using your forearms using your elbows and with all of those you can have a much larger surface area you can have a much you can generate a much larger force with less stress on your joints and less stress on on your body and on your muscles because i could inflict see a lot more pain on your clients a lot more pain <laughs> especially with an elbow yeah. <laughs> so, so i could see how i could see how people who do swedish massage can you know later in life find they have difficulties but doing the deep tissue especially using your know, forearms and elbows it's 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 almost um a world of difference in terms of being able to perform it on somebody and not feel absolutely exhausted afterwards so how long ago did you do that course so that course was i completed that course maybe i want to say to do about two months ago so i completed that course two months ago and then i just thrown out there i just wanted some practice so i thrown out to a, a few um facebook friends about kind of having quick practice on them and you know got lots and lots of really good um, reviews back i find that i'm much better at sensing these things called palpitations and knots in muscles um i'm finding the knots in muscles and being able to work out the knots and knots in muscles as in breaking them down um and also being able to help with um stresses and strains with joints especially around the shoulders because a lot of people their shoulders their neck their back um, they find there's a lot of a lot of problems around there, and with deep tissue, it really helps to release a lot of tension that you that can build up in those areas. And do you have any particular clients that you specialise in at the moment? So at the moment, I'm I, there's no one particular I specialise in, but at the moment, most of the people I'm treating are people who are um, either sports people or people who regularly go to the gym. So gym users who usually find that they've pulled a muscle, or usually find that they're they're very stiff um like i say back neck shoulders back neck shoulder areas um and that's those are the people who are mostly dealing with the moment great and with um sports massage obviously you do the biology and you work out where all of the muscles attach and insert and everything are you able to help people with working out where their injuries come from and in terms of the biomechanics how their movement patterns are and that kind of thing so yeah without i think the interesting thing is without the the training um the actual training as in terms of you know physiotherapy or, or chiropractor or anything like that um having no biology background means that i'm much better able at um i'm much better able at, at knowing where things refer to so what one part is linked to another part and then how that is then causing them a Hello, welcome back to the 91.8 Hayes FM Health and Fitness Show. We're talking about injuries. So if you have any injuries and you'd like any advice, tweet us at Hayes FM Official. Get those questions in now and Mark can answer them. So I'm going to start by being selfish and ask you about my injury. <laughs> so let's talk about lower back injuries because there's many reasons, isn't there, that people could have a lower back injury. How are you supposed to find out what exactly is wrong when you just have a back pain and you don't know exactly what the cause is? so lower back injury so with with all injuries if you've got any sort of muscular pain there's usually something called a referral point so a referral point is usually where you've got another part of your body and in the other part of your body that's where the pain really originates so when you're working on these knots when i'm working on these palpitations you'll then find that it actually travels up or down your body to a different to a separate part of your body and those nerves that then refer that pain may go from let's say your lower back and you say oh i can feel i can feel that down my right leg or oh i can feel that in my up in my shoulder and you know that you've got the muscles going towards that area that you need to work on in order to help loosen up the back pain because a lot of the time if you've got for example pain in your lower back it may even be your calves so interesting so being able to find where that pain comes from and work on that pain is is really key to other than just trying to sort out the lower back so if you just try and sort out the lower back and say right your lower back's fine now and they go off and their calves are still really still really tight mm -hmm. then after a couple more days it's going to refer back up and it's going to pull all of those muscles and go back to the lower back again yep i mean i started off with knee injuries mm -hmm. so i'm wondering in like you're saying about the calf could it be that my knee injury although i've been working on the knees and rehabbing them they're getting better 
but now the back started to go yeah could that be as a result of the knees yes yeah it could be and the other thing you need to remember is that if you have an injury in one part of your body what your body does is it compensates and by compensating it means there's another part of your body another group of muscles which will be working harder to try to compensate for the injury mm -hmm. and what that can do if that's not addressed properly is then cause the injury cause another injury in a, se in a separate part of your body so yep. like you say you've got the pain in your knees and maybe because you've got the pain in your knees you're perhaps over overextending your hips in some way or your pelvis and then that's feeding back into your lower back um, it may be affecting how you stand it may be affecting how you sit um, just to try and ease the pain on your knees and therefore you're then building up more pain and pressure in your lower back. With my particular injury, some people have said to me it might be my psoas muscle. So for those who are listening, it's something that attaches to your back and it goes through your hip to the front. So when I'm sitting in like a flex position, it's getting tight and then when I stand up, it's pulling and almost pulling on my spine, maybe even popping and getting really painful. Ouch, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> How do I, like for example, switch off that muscle? Because I had tight muscles on the side of my legs, which were pulling mm -hmm. the knees, rolling them, doing the foam rolling, having massage, that kind of thing, relax that type of a muscle. But because this one runs internally how do you massage it and get it to relax so it's not going to be a case so much of massaging that particular muscle it's going to be a case more of um stretching stretching out like you said um but then you what you want to do is you want to massage the muscles around it so it's particularly looking at your glutes like you say your thighs front of legs and also your lower back and by massaging those out if those are relaxed then it's going to be less of a pull in your psoas muscle so therefore um that should hopefully relax as well but you want to be looking at the muscles around that muscle and then you want to be, be relaxing those off because like I say it will refer and it will pull and pull and pull so you relax off the other muscles and then hopefully that should help to ease the pain there. And how do you get muscles to relax? So the easiest way to get muscles to relax are um, trigger point uh, therapy is very good so either a thumb or a knuckle or an elbow or um, a foam roller or a cricket ball or anything like that anything hard that you can just put onto the point where the muscle is knotted where you can feel the pain and what it does is it it causes the muscle to tighten even more and then as it's released the muscle relaxes this is why it hurts when you do those this is why it hurts a lot mm. when you do those yes it, um it relaxes if you're doing this yourself as so as a massage therapist what i would normally do is I'll find a palpitation, find a knot, put pressure onto it, and then ask my um, client for a, a mark out of 10. And we're looking for between six, six to eight. If it's nine or 10, that's probably too much. And if it's lower than six, then you're not gonna be having that much of, a, of an effect. So six to eight on a pain scale out of 10. 10 obviously that's quite being the worst. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is quite high, yeah, it's not, it's not nice. And then they simply, I simply hold that, deep breaths for a minute, 90 seconds, and then I will release it. Mm -hmm. I will just massage around the area, increase blood flow, because obviously when you're breaking down these knots and muscles, you're releasing um, toxins and chemicals from the cells as it's breaking down. That needs to be washed away. Then I will go back on with the same, at the same, exactly the same point, and mark again out of 10, and you're looking for a reduction. But you may need to repeat this two or three times on a single point to get that reduction. And then you're looking for any referral points, and you simply do the same at those referral points. And would that all be done in one session or do you need to do that like once a week? Well, that, it depends on the individual. So if, let's say, um, somebody came along and they'd, they'd hurt their right shoulder, it may simply be their right shoulder is, is the, the issue and so I could treat their right shoulder in one session. Or it may be that the right shoulder is symptomatic of, it could be their chest, it could be their neck, it could be going up into the jawline, it could be going down the lower back, even, like I said, down the legs into the calves. If that's the case, then you get, it's, it's very difficult and very, very painful to have this trigger point treatment on multiple points throughout your body in one single session. Mm -hmm. So it will be a case of, well, let's schedule in through two or three sessions over the next few weeks um, where we can address all of these issues and then you should be, a, should be as good as gold as long as you're doing things like rolling, and stretching outside of session so it's it's all very well going to see a, a massage therapist for a deep tissue massage and expecting and coming away feeling really good because you will come away feeling really good um but you need to then maintain it so you need to do the stretching going back to personal development 
go to Tony Robbins, mm. great, but go away and, and keep doing things. Don't just go to Tony Robbins and then think, that's me done for the next five yeah. years. At the same time, though, your like nervous system and you know the connection between your brain and your muscles has been working in one way say for example one side's tight and the other side's loose you've been exercising in that way for so long so even if you loosen up in one session you're going to go back to the same habits aren't you and exercising in that way yeah how do we get that brain to body signal to yeah so switch off so in that in that sense what you, the best thing to do is to to work closely with both a massage therapist and a personal trainer who will, who can then communicate with each other and say, look, I've just been treating this person, their, their shoulder's really, really tight, they just need some exercises, um, I've loosened it up, they need some exercises to make sure that they don't then just revert back to putting um, too much stress and pressure on there. And as you know, um, Nicola, it might be more about helping strengthen the other side um, or to strengthen another part of the body so that it's not so much, there's not as much load being bared on that one part of the body. It's quite interesting, isn't it? That it's, it's actually quite hard to get the balance. And you think in some ways it's bad to exercise because you get all these issues, don't you, when you start getting strong. Yeah. Some muscles get stronger than others mm -hmm. and then the other ones become weak and then you get all these imbalances. But then obviously if you sit at your desk all day, you're going to have imbalances just from sitting still mm. and not moving your body. Yeah, I get... Um, I used to go to the gym a lot and just do as heavy weights as I possibly could, which, which, which well, for me was ridiculous because it was not sustainable and when you're at the gym and i know guys and a lot of girls as well now will go to the gym just to try and lift as heavy weights they possibly can because it's a sign of strength it's a sign of you being powerful but for me it's to satisfy your ego <laughs> it's to satisfy your ego yeah it's so you can look in the mirror and go wow look how great i look um but for me by doing that i, I constantly had lower back pain constantly had lower back pain because i was too, work, doing too much work on my chest which was pulling my shoulders which was pulling up all the way down my back and I was doing too many squats in the incorrect position, which was then referring up and really, really painful um, back pain. In fact, one day at the gym, I remember I did a, a squat. This is probably one of the worst times of my life. I did a squat. I was on the gym on my own. This is when I was at the school, private school. And as I came up, I just felt something go in my back and I just had to drop the bar and collapse on the floor in fetus position. Did you collapse under the bar? No, I no, managed rolled, to get it off. Yeah, it got off. <laughs> but I was, oh, the, the words coming out of my mouth, you, <laughs> you wouldn't want to know, Nicola. So I was there, and there was no one else there. So I was there for about 10 minutes, just just trying to compose myself. Mm. Um, but luckily, I had a session with my um, physio that afternoon. So I then went to, I managed to crawl into my car and get to my physio, who treated me. But there wasn't a great deal you can do. You know, if, if you first have an injury, and it becomes inflamed yeah. then any massage or treatment isn't really going to be that effective you need to wait until it's gone down so then i had to get myself back i was in in bed for two or three days with it just trying to trying to get onto my feet um before i could actually start moving around again and i haven't really done squats properly since then the point of that story is that now i'm much more about doing the calisthenics I'm, i much prefer just the body weight exercises um, because I think, for me anyway, it's, it, it means that I can self-adjust. So instead of having a very heavy weight where I just simply put as much strength as I can into pushing it up or pulling it, um, if, I feel like, uh, if I feel like I'm more, if I'm pushing more on one side or the other on a press-up or a squat, then I can see that in the mirror and I can simply just make that, that short adjustment myself. So I'm much more about now just using body weight to, to do exercises. Mm. Mm. I haven't got to that place yet. I still like the heavy weight. I still... <laughs> <laughs> However, I have definitely moved... The people at Hayes who've listened to me before know how I moved from aesthetics into athletics, if you like. Yeah. So completely moving away from what you yeah. look like. Because yeah. like you're saying there, the, the guy's pumping the chest all the time and getting yeah. all, you know the, the rounded shoulders and, yeah. and obviously everything's out of balance. And that usually happens. If people are just training to shape their body in a certain way, yeah. they're not looking at how their body moves, how it's functional, is that muscle even to the opposite yeah. muscle? And they're just training for the way they look and then they mm -hmm. can get all these issues. The, yeah, the issue there is, you know, when you're training for the way you look, you, you're predominantly working on what you're chest and your arms really if you're a guy Man, yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe maybe your back but even your back's kind of like you're not that really that fussed about it yeah and men just go for what they can see in the yeah, mirror in front exactly of yeah exactly yeah. 
Um, <laughs> so, so therefore, you're going to have loads of problems with the rest of your body because there's no balance. And there are guys at a gym, and it's just incredible how small their legs are compared to the rest of their body. It's it's literally incredible. I mean, you see a lot of athletes, and a lot of athletes are going and push big weights that are proportionally they're they're all they've got they've got the muscles in the right places simply because they pushing big weights as a supplement to help them to get stronger to run faster to to throw to whatever it is that they're, to swim faster to whatever it is that they're doing so yeah they're going in but they're, they're also they weights. have trainers and they have trainers they're doing it correctly they're physios. doing prehab yep they've got all of the stretches. small muscles with the bands yep. they're icing yep. everything they yeah so they're doing all of this stuff um but in the gym you know you just see them pushing big weights and and it's it's knowing the difference between pushing big weights for the sake of pushing big weights so you look good and pushing big weights so you've got some sort of functional use from pushing those big weights in my life i don't need to push big weights because uh, I, don't, I don't need to use it i'm all i'm going to be doing that's really any sort of physical exertion is my massage therapy and so for me it's more about just keeping healthy and doing the calisthenics for that and how often are you training yourself so I am um, my my goal, and again this goes back to the um, personal development goals. Um, my goal is three days a week of gym and two or three runs a week. So you, the run will be about three miles, and the gym workout will be about will be about an hour. And that's just that's just bas- basically comprised of um, squats, press ups, uh, sit ups, um, pull ups, or chin ups. And a couple of weights, weight, weighted bits here and there, but nothing um, that is going to be anything too strenuous in terms of pushing heavy, weight, heavy weights for me. So is the ultimate goal just to be all round fit so that you can live your life? Yes, the ultimate goal and is... And do your job as a muscle. Yes, yeah, the ultimate goal is for me to be able to live to a ripe old age and not mm-hmm. have loads of body problems. But do you agree that it, you have to get to a certain age to feel that way about your body? <laughs> <laughs> Like initially, everybody starts with aesthetics, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. all the injuries and everything happens, and then we kind of change our minds and think, "Oh, do you know what? I need to be more functionally strong and fit and able." And then later, when you start thinking about, "Can I do this exercise when I'm 80?" Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> or am I going to do it now and then damage myself so I can't do any when I'm 80? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. Comes as you get older, I think. I think yeah. So I rem- I remember when I was young, and I saw um, Conan the Barbarian. Have you seen that? I think so. Arnold Schwarzenegger film. Oh and, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I saw that and I was like, he's absolutely massive. Yeah. And then you kind of look, you kind of look at the stuff, and he's like, oh, he was Mister Mister Universe, I think, and he's just got really big muscles. And for a guy, you just see pictures of guys with really big muscles, and you think, oh, that's what I, that's what I want to that's what I want to achieve. And the only exception, I think, and I may be wrong here, but the only exception I think is if you're um, going to become or looking to become a professional sportsman. At that point, you'll have coaches and you'll have people who will who will then guide you away from pushing big weights just for the aesthetics of it. But I think for regular Joe or Jane, it's a case of how can I do whatever I can to look as good as possible for someone that I want to attract effectively or so that I look, feel good about myself when I look at myself in the mirror. Because you, you speak to women and... You say, oh, you know, you should do some light weights because it's it'll be helped to And they go, oh no, no, I don't want to look like these big, these big muscle-bound women. And it's, ca- it's a case of saying, well, ha- do you know what? Do you know how much effort they have to put in? Do you know the regime that they have to go through, the foods that they have to eat, well, how much they have to mm. starve themselves? All of this. You don't to, get muscles get by accident. No, I always you don't. tell people. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. You yeah. don't get muscles by accident, and you have to put in so much effort. So. So I, I think people do use that as an excuse. And I've spoken to guys before and said, you know, why don't we just go, go do like a light workout? Oh, no, I'll, I, put on, I put on weight too easily. I can't, I can't work out. I can't go to gym. I can't do this. I can't do that. And it's just excuses based around the fact that they don't really want to, they don't really want to change. They don't really want to put mm-hmm. the effort in to make the change. And yet they still want to talk about um, the fact that they need to change, yeah. lose some weight or tone up or gain some weight or whatever it is do you hear yourself making excuses oh all the time sometimes you know when you you say it and then you realize oh that's my conscious mind (laughs) making an excuse for that (laughs) i love it because i i just have uh, conversations with myself i literally have conversations with myself 
and this goes back to the personal development on any level about any topic i will have conversation with myself so i did a um presentation the other day a biology presentation to uh, a group of um management and advertising leaders for a big shampoo company and i just i i'd said to myself oh i haven't you know i haven't really presented i haven't really taught in in such a long time it's not going to be very good and i was like hang on why are you, why are you saying this to yourself you like you've you've got 16 years of experience you know exactly what you're talking about so i do i don't know i'll call myself on my own on my own rubbish when i say it and then i will have that conversation with myself and then go off and do it yeah I mean, a lot of things. Lot I have conversations with myself all the time, and if you weren't here today, I'd be talking to myself for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now it's time for the news, so we're going to come back, and I'd love to talk a little bit more actually about that personal development in terms of the NLP and you know our fears and our beliefs, because that's that's my bag. <laughs> <laughs> right after this, so stay tuned. Get us your questions in at. Welcome back to 91.8 Hayes FM, the Fustal Fit Health and Fitness Show. I'm Nicola Fustal, and today I have with me... Mark Lotsu. <laughs> You're getting into this now, aren't you? <laughs> you could be a weekly guest. So I was just talking to Mark there off air about um, the coaching that I've been doing. I've been learning NLP, which is something that Tony Robbins does, and um, helps people to be more positive in their life and achieving their goals. And just before the um, ad there, you were telling us about your goals and your, your goals of fitness. Can we dive into your goals a little bit and then I'll see if I can help you with them yeah, on it. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Well, my, my fitness goals. Yeah, tell us about your goals. So, my, my, my primary fitness goal is to be able to live a long and healthy life. It's to be able to, um, I, I wanna have kids. Um, I've recently just met the love of my life, so I want to settle down and have kids. That's, that's something that I never thought um, would ever happen to me. I um, want to settle down and have kids, and I want to be, you know, a 80-year-old dad still able to run, stumble around, <laughs> um, to be able to play with them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You've kind of done a lot of the questions that I would have asked you already, just in that, because a lot right. of people say, I've got um, a fitness goal, for example, and they may not realise that it's not actually about the fitness, it's not mm. really about the gym and lifting a certain weight, it's really because it's something deep and personal and emotional and like you just said it's about yeah. being a dad and being 80 years old and yeah. like running around after your kids and grandkids and it's like a yeah. lifelong thing a lot of people don't realize like most people who go to a personal trainer the first thing like probably 95 percent of people say i want to lose weight but mm -hmm. they think it's all about the aesthetics yeah. they think it's because they need to look a certain way because then they'll be happy mm -hmm. you know or then they'll be confident so then if confidence is the thing they're looking for or happiness is, is the thing they're looking for are they going to get that in a body yeah you know your body's going to change throughout your life yeah. and maybe really what they wanted is is a baby mm -hmm. you know or maybe they really wanted a partner mm -hmm. and they wanted companionship and it, it normally is something really deep down emotional yeah but you just gave me that i think <laughs> I, I think that's, that's Do you have it. Any other goals? <laughs> <laughs> i think that's interesting because i hadn't thought that but I think because we're both from such a strong personal development point of view and that's that's pretty much how we see ourselves and that's how we perceive ourselves in this world and we and how we plan our futures that for me it's it was it's about right it I mean don't get me wrong it used to be I just want to have really big arms um and I want to have a, a ripped six pack um just because I think it would look really really cool and then I'd be able to get loads of women because of it. That's that was that was my fitness goal for years, literally, Nicola, years. And it is only by reflecting on yourself and by looking at what you want for your future that you can really get down to the core of what your goals are. Because if you don't have an idea of what you want to do in the future, then you don't really have an idea of what what goals you want to actually achieve. So I think. It's. I think it's. It's funny that you've said that because, in my mind, I've, I've said, "Oh yeah, my my fitness goal has always been to, to to want to live to an old age." But it hasn't, and it wasn't until you said it then that I thought, actually, no, that wasn't always my fitness goal. But no, that is now. Or um, until you said it out loud. Yeah, until I like, said it. Now I know. <laughs> yeah. I've got these goals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So I think a lot of times when you do make these goals, you, you kind of make excuses as to why you have them without really delving into it. 
but that comes from self-reflection doesn't it yeah where you just sit there and you you really just take time because one thing people don't people don't have to nowadays is is time to themselves and when you take a little bit of time for yourself to sit there and you look at what it is that you're doing with your life why you're doing what you're doing with your life and what it is that you want to achieve from your life do you see the things that aren't making you happy do you think do you see the things that you know won't give you the life that you want to have and without having that time to sit and reflect you can't do it so when it goes back to teaching when i was teaching i, I was teaching you know i was up at six in the morning i wasn't going to bed till 11 12 o'clock at night most of that time i was either teaching because it was a private school you're going from nine till five um, and then in the evenings, I'd either have duty or I'd be doing extra tuition or I'd be planning or I'd be marking. So we're talking about not having time to think for yourself. I, I was the epitome of that throughout my entire um, teaching career. Every single hour that I would have, I would give to trying to do my very best to make sure the kids could get good, res good grades in their results. And that was it. And I, I neglected myself, I neglected friends, I neglected family, I neglected relationships. But by coming out of it and going to these, um, getting into the world of personal development, I spent a lot more time focused on myself. Not so do you agree now that it was actually a good thing, that bad time in your life, you know, when you were told not to teach anymore? Yes, 100%. I, I completely see it as probably the best thing that could have happened to me. Don't get me wrong, I'm not Good saying it was... a bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not saying it was an amazing, it was an amazing thing, because it wasn't. It was it was the worst the worst time of my life and it was the worst thing that i could have done and based on how much i love teaching it was literally it was it was as horrendous as it could have been for me but it was a, it was really good that i got the ban because without the ban i wouldn't be the man that i am now without the ban i would still be plodding away as it were um teaching don't get me wrong f fantastic teacher but still be plodding away teaching and not doing anything else in my life and now i've got all these other avenues all these other potential um sources of of help that i can do and give to people that i'm i want to explore and you know i've still got a lot more um in me and a lot more ahead of me and do you think that that dark time in your life was the first time that you'd noticed your mental health or had you before that oh 100 percent nicola like with i can't like i can't put into words how much that highlighted mental health issues for me I, i've always been a very positive person and ever since i was a kid i've always been really happy and really positive in everything that i do and in and always i look at stuff and i think that's probably why it didn't really hit me properly until the actual um bam because i kept on thinking it was going to be all right so even when the exam board were doing the investigation i kept thinking do you know what it's actually going to be okay um they're not going to find anything the kids are going to get their course for Mars. It's all going to be fine, and it's it's like it's like that kids game. You know that kids game. I don't know why I thought of this, where all the you've got one kid facing the wall and all the other kids are behind him, and then they I think they say what time? What's the time, Mr. Wolf? Right? And then they slowly creep up, mm -hmm. slowly creep up. It was like that. I kept on saying it was now. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And it's just slowly creeping up on me. And every single day. I would come out and I'd put a smile on my face and I'd be really happy and it's just slowly, just in, my, in the back of my mind, in my subconscious, just slowly eating away at my soul um, until it got to the point where it, it just became so overwhelming and I couldn't see any way out of it and I couldn't see how I was going to do anything else. I, I, like I say, I taught for 16 years, I taught in this country, I taught in America and it, I've, I love nothing more than teaching and when you can't see a way out of it, when you can't see yourself doing anything else what what's the point of life like what's the point of carrying on and it was a very did you think that teaching was your identity 100 percent. you are the teacher <laughs> oh so therefore God. you lost your identity <laughs> for a while oh my gosh nicola you're so good yeah <laughs> that's exactly what it is this is this is some serious coaching but you age, just, isn't it you reminded me of myself because when i had 
the whole eating disorder and body image issues i was the fit girl i gave myself that identity and i had to fulfill that every day because of the people in front of me in my class and so therefore when i lost that because i was decided to change my life and become healthy and i had this big transition inside my head so people on the outside couldn't see it but it was really hard to continue that job thinking that i am this person or that i need to be this person for these people and then actually be vulnerable learn who i really am inside and, and lose that whole identity for for a while i was a bit lost like who am i if i'm not that mm -hmm. because i remember having a conversation with someone they said what do you do like and i was like oh, okay well i do fitness for a job i talk about fitness on the radio <laughs> everything fitness, fitness what are you doing your time off um well i go for a run <laughs> i go to the gym i do yeah fitness. it's just fitness yeah. fitness and they were like but what else yeah and i'd always been a mum and had a husband and everything but my identity was really the fitness and without that i felt like who am i yeah that's so it's interesting you had that in another industry so can i ask you how did you come out of that then how did you how did you find yourself again after the losing the identity yeah, i did have some coaching mm -hmm. so that kind of helped me to assess my values who i am deep down what i really want for my life and like we said about the exercising into your 80s mm -hmm. compared to i just want to do stuff now yeah. it became more important to me to do stuff for the longevity and the family kind of went up the scale in in terms of importance yeah. the fitness went down mm -hmm. um but it really was it was definitely a, a hard time very mm -hmm. difficult um but i think you have to go that down sometimes yeah. to find who you are and then come back up otherwise you're living a life that's not really yours yeah. you're living what you think people want of you you know of you yeah sometimes it could be even what the media want like to say oh i needed to look like a fitness instructor as well because i am my brand i need to be yeah. lean i need to look like yeah. these ones on the magazines which is why i did bodybuilding mm -hmm. and really that that's not me i don't need to be yeah. doing that i actually want to be the person who is different the person mm -hmm. who makes change who is a leader mm -hmm. who can teach my kids to be the person that they, they want to be and not have to fit into society mm -hmm. so that became more important to me and that's why i started talking more about my experiences and being the voice of change mm -hmm. so i can talk in a um place full of fitness instructors and they're like oh my god like i've yeah. been living that life and i've been a robot and trying to fit into society yeah. and be the leader that everyone thinks i should be when really you know and maybe that's not who i am it's funny because when you're saying about the in terms of the image of a fitness instructor you go to any gym and you you know line up all the fitness instructors you've got all different shapes and sizes but then you ask anybody in the public right who would you rather be trained by and you know they're going to go for probably the skinniest woman or the the muscliest man mm. um and that may be just genetics that yeah. may be based on um the guy perhaps has taken steroids like it's it's a fake image for yeah. that one person potentially and then you you think oh because they look like that they can help me look like that which is yeah. completely false and it's it's almost better to go for someone who who you you have a much better connection with because then they will understand what works for them and that and, and they know that that will work for you as well yeah that's really that is really which interesting is, i think the hardest thing for me was being that vulnerable person in front of my group yeah. and i did a speech at move fit so it was like i'd never done public speaking before <laughs> and it, it was the scariest thing in my <laughs> life <laughs> i think i made myself ill for about a month before oh, me. i was no. so nervous but i actually practiced my speech to my members yeah. and I, I was crying my eyes out i couldn't help it and my one of my biggest fears was crying in public because i felt that yeah. crying makes you vulnerable <laughs> and makes you weak because that's how i was brought up with my dad being chinese and telling yeah. me that crying was weak um but yeah that's another issue <laughs> but yeah just being there in front of my um members yeah. being open and honest and telling them this is you know who i really am mm -hmm. and i was putting on all of that front for you guys mm -hmm. really and they were just like normal people they cried with me yeah and like, oh my god we didn't know so, it's so funny isn't it like with, with crying you just people just don't get that it's okay to cry mm. and i think it's more acceptable for women to cry because it, the society's um, perception is, you know, w women cry. You know, that's 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 just in something some ways you might say that, on. but then in other ways, I would see it as the opposite. Because I think, well, I don't want to, like women are perceived as weaker, aren't they? That's why it's okay <coughs> to cry. They're emotional, <coughs> but because I've yeah. had roles like management and yeah, being a mum as well. Being because my first daughter is eighteen now, so mm -hmm. I was a teen mum. Even then, it was proving myself to be a strong and capable person. Yeah. You wouldn't want to cry in public because you yeah. wouldn't be seen as coping. 
I think it's probably different for parents, isn't it? And because I know that, you know, as a parent, it must be... I, I speak like I'm a parent, but I know nothing about parenting. <laughs> as a parent, it must be difficult to to show a range of emotions in front of your kids simply because you don't want your kids to see you as being weak. Um, but then, conversely, it may be, you know what, kids, it's okay to cry. You know what, mummy's, daddy's had a, had a tough time something's happened and we cry about it because that's how we release our emotions and as a guy for me it was it was always about you know you'd never cry and then with the ban phew, never cry so much in my life i think i probably cried more in the last two years than i have <laughs> in the rest of my life put together but it feels so good yeah is it okay to cry now oh it's, i love crying <laughs> i cry all the time i do as <laughs> <laughs> My sister says I'm too emotional. I'm like, well, I have hormones now. So that's one of the things when you're dieting so much. Your yeah, hormones just shuts don't work. Down, you're basically it? just yeah. a robot. Yeah. So I was, and that's the thing. In my classes, I was giving so much, like fitness-wise. People were, oh, she's so fit. She's a robot. They <laughs> yeah. actually said that. Yeah. That I actually yeah. took on that identity and became yeah. it. No emotions, nothing. Just yeah. performing every time I go to the gym. Even if I've had to have a nap in the daytime and have a Red Bull to get me going, mm -hmm. and then I'm there. Yeah. You know, which is obviously not healthy. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So, back to you. Back to me. So yeah, and we my talked identity. about, yes, your identity as the teacher. <laughs> How did you get yourself out of that then? How did you realise that there are other parts of you? So, it took me, took me a long time to, to realise that. It took me a long time to realise the fact that the happy, positive, outgoing person um, wasn't the teacher mark. It was it was me as my lots as a person. That's that's the happy, positive, outgoing person. But my life became a teacher, and you know you, when you're pretty much every single waking moment, especially for the you know the last five years of my teaching career, I was a teacher. Every single waking moment, I was a teacher. That's it. During holidays, I go in and do X session with the kids. You go in for exam results. You go in to do this. You go in to do that. So that's all I was. So coming out of it. I guess being, I guess the the best way was that that was all taken from me, and as that, that was all ripped from me, that I wasn't a teacher anymore, and because I I wasn't a teacher anymore, I had to find out who I was, so that then became the happy outgoing me was me. So that's why I think at that point I thought, you know what, just just be yourself, and what will come will come. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant note to finish on for the break. There, be yourself, and what will come will come. <laughs> 91.8 Hayes FM. Great West London. Welcome back to the 91.8 Hayes FM Health and Fitness Show. We're talking about public speaking, and I was just sharing my experience with Mark Lotsu there off air about doing my talk at MoveFit, which was at the XL. And so I was pretty scared because I knew it was the XL, which is a massive place, and I had no idea where I'd be standing, how many people would be around me. I knew it was going to be open, so everybody in the XL could potentially hear my speech <laughs> come by. But it actually turned out to be a good thing because where I was, one lady had walked by, seen all the images that I had on the screen, heard a couple of words, and she was and she just stopped and she stayed there for the rest of the speech. And at the end, she'd come up to me with tears in her eyes she'd been crying and she said I needed to hear that right now because I'd been going through everything that you'd gone through but one of the things why I was so scared is because I was talking about myself and I know in obviously you've done public speaking in terms of teaching I don't know what else experience you've had but a lot of people talk about a, a topic which is not about themselves and so I felt like I'm mm -hmm. going to cry I'm going to have all these emotions and then obviously coming up with my limiting beliefs about crying in front of people yeah. What was your experience of public speaking and how did you get confident with it? <clears throat> so I think we all we all have self doubt and I think we all question why are we good enough to do whatever it is that, that we've been asked to do or that we want to do. So for, for the for me it was initially um the first thing I did many years ago was to do an assembly and when you're doing an assembly, I was doing an assembly then to about 400 kids in a big assembly hall. And when you're in a big assembly hall, you've got, you know, there's there's the headmaster and assistant heads and, and there's a little of you as a teacher. And you think, why am I doing this? What, what makes me good enough to be able to stand here and talk to all of these kids? But at the end of the day, that's it. It's you. 
Like, the fact that it's you that can do it, that's what makes it, that's what makes you good enough, because it's your perspective, it's, it's the words you use, it's the way you stand, it's how you behave, it's all of that. It's all, they're all methods of communication, as you know, it's all ways of communicating with people, and by doing that, you're communicating your story, whether you're talking about yourself or talking about something else, it's how you get this, this message across. And so many people, I think, as I did, question what makes them good enough. Do you think, though, it was um, harder because you had other teachers in the room? Oh, it Compared was... Compared to if it was just you <laughs> and children, you'd probably feel like, well, I've got more knowledge Nic than them, yeah. so it's OK. <laughs> yeah, Nicholas, so if you're standing there, if you're standing in a room with all these kids and you've got people who have been teaching for 20, 30 years who have done um, assembly after assembly after assembly after assembly, you've got... You feel, at least I felt, there was so much judgment on me. But this goes back to what we said earlier about th there's no judgment on you, it's only your perception of it. Of, of other people's presence being there, you think, oh, well, they must be judging me. Yeah. Um, and I, f I did feel like there are so many people there. And when you look up to people and you think, oh, they're a really good presenter, they're a really good talker, why should I, why, why am I going to be able to do this when, when, when they're there, when they could be much better at this than me? So I felt, I felt massively insecure about it. But then... I don't know if you found this, but as soon as you start talking, as soon as you look into people's eyes, because that's one thing I'm very big on, and especially if you're talking to groups of people, if you're looking into people's eyes, engaging with people, and I know as a scientist it sounds a bit silly, but I, I believe like you can really see into somebody when you look into their eyes, and maybe it's a, it's a case of the whole thing. You know, you're looking at their how they move their head, their eyes, the body language, all of that stuff. But, but there's I, nothing worse than the opposite when yeah. you're watching a speech <laughs> and somebody's not looking at anybody someone, someone, yeah. and you feel like, oh, they, or, they think very highly of themselves, they're not even looking yeah. at us. <laughs> or, you, or they're like focusing, they're doing thing where, you know, they're focusing on the back wall or something. So yeah. it looks like they're looking out to you, but you're like, I don't think he's looking at anybody here, which, which, which kind of then is a little bit off-putting because you want people to engage with you no matter what situation you want people to engage. That's what Tony does. When Tony's, when he's, the eyes. Yeah, when he's talking, when he's talking to one Those person, eight thousand people. <laughs> when he's talking to one person, so he'll say to that one person, he'll say, um, "When did you first notice this from happening?" And then that person will say, "Oh, when I was a, when I was a child, I was I went to school one day, and that's where I first noticed it." And then and then it goes, "When I was a child, ladies and gentlemen, when you went to school, for, I'm I'm moving them around like you can see me. I'm on the radio, but I'm moving my head around like you can see me." Um, and he looks. He I can looks probably around hear your voice moving away and moving. Oh back. yeah, that's good. That, that's the same effect. <laughs> I um, mean, he looks around at people. Mm. And so having that engagement made me feel much more secure. Don't get me wrong, I still felt nervous about going up and, and talking and presenting. When you're in a classroom, if it's just you and 20 kids and you're telling them about photosynthesis and green plants, that, that's a piece of cake. But if it's you and 400 kids and you're telling them about, I don't know, why they, why they should be careful why they should be careful with drugs or why they should um, be nice to each other, then I think that makes it much more difficult to be able to, to, be able to have that conversation with them. And you do then feel like you're questioning yourself, especially if there are people in the room who have got more experience than you. Because if people in the room have got more experience than you, then you feel, why, shouldn't, why, why am I talking and why shouldn't they talk instead? So you managed to do it though, you overcame those fears and you did it, yeah. and that was even before you took this self-development journey. Yes, yes, but that was because I had to. Yeah, but do you feel <laughs> like it gets any easier, Oh. or now that you're just aware of it and you have different coping mechanisms to use? That's a good question. I think, I think it's a combination of the two. So, here's an example. You have to give a talk about, um, I don't know, doing a radio show. And you have to give a talk about doing a radio show to all of the big bosses at Radio 1. So you'll go in and you'll do the talk. And, you know, you might be scared about doing the talk because these are all the big bosses and they know everything about doing a radio show, what do you know, etc., etc. You go in and do that. And you come out and think, actually, it wasn't too bad. And they go, do you know what, that was, Nicola, thanks a lot for that talk. That was a really good talk. We really enjoyed that. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, that was a good talk. Then you, you get a call saying, right, we want you to come and do the same for all the capital XM, XFM um, bosses. I don't know if that's a station <laughs> or not, but <laughs> you're on to go and do a talk to all of them. You've already got the experience of doing the talk to Radio 1 bosses, so you think, actually, yeah, this is fine. I can go and do, go and do a talk for them. You'll still mm -hmm. feel a bit nervous. But for me, the coping strategy was based mostly around 
doing doing incantations repeating positive phrases to yourself so that you feel it's um you feel you've got the strength to be able to go and do it so for me i felt like if i'm going to go and do a talk so I that's will... now though because you didn't have those before yeah 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 so yeah but you just had to cause so before yeah you before employed. you had to before you had to mm. but once you do it once and people say well done then you can go and do the next one and you can go and do the next yeah. one because but you really got that after the break we're going to come back and talk about when they don't say well done <laughs> 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 and they give you a negative experience <laughs> about the situation so right back after the local <laughs> welcome back to 91.8 haze fm the fusil fit health and fitness show we're just having a few laughs here in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, you can let it out now. You I was just talking about um, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> because I had my charity event at the weekend, which I, I spoke to you guys about. If, you, if you're still here from, from one o'clock when we started, and if you're not, I had a charity event to raise money and awareness for the charity Hillingdon Mind. Um, so it's all about mental health, and I wanted to get people involved in doing activities because exercise can actually help people to heal from certain things like depression and anxiety. But it's often a catch-22 situation because when you're feeling that low, you may not feel motivated to do any exercise in the first place. So I wanted to make exercise out in the streets. People can come and join in, try a little bit, something that's not so structured, not like a, a gym type environment you can just try a bit leave if you want to and hopefully get people involved in doing the activities and it was great it was a great day we had the hitting the mayor down Hayes <laughs> FM were there we did interviews with uh, the mayor and so some of the people that were joining in and the director of Hillingdon Mines so that was great and all of the people at Hillingdon they've all had their own experience of mental health as well so they understand the service users and they understand the people in the local community so it was a really good event and most of it came about just from me asking for it so I asked Intu to use the space. I asked the mind to get together and um, the Hillingdon Mayor and everybody said yes. So That's so good. You just have to ask. That's so good. <laughs> Take that away. Just ask. Yeah, because sometimes our fears, and we were talking about fears before, our fears get in the way, don't they? And if you think, I want to ask this person this, mm. but I know they're going to say no because yeah. of this, this and this, and then your fear stops you from even asking in the first place. Yeah. And that person wasn't a mind reader. If you just ask, they may actually say yes. Yeah, yeah. Have no, you ever had definitely. that experience, Mark? All, all the time. So I do get, a lot of the times, I do get an experience where I, I do, I do worry about doing something. Um, today, for example, Nicola, you know, we, did, we did, haven't known each other since, since um, before this at all. Uh, it's just a random connection on Facebook. And I thought to myself, well, what, what am I going to say? I don't know how, how it's going to go. I don't even know what she's going to be like. I don't know where it's going to be. I know nothing about it. And you do, I did kind of think, should I go in? Oh, should I just not I bother? I hope she <laughs> Yeah, I was like, is she just going <laughs> to, is she just not going to message me? Is that really good? And yeah, when I messaged you saying, oh, um, what's the address or whatever it was, and you messaged back, I was like, oh, it's still going to be going ahead. Great. <laughs> yeah, that was you checking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice way of just checking mm. um and so you do and you know you do you do presentations you do talks and you do have a fear of what if it goes wrong and sometimes it does and sometimes you know you come out of the talk and think oh that was awful because i i couldn't remember what i was meant to be saying i kept on playing with my um shirt buttons i wasn't looking at the right people i wasn't being loud enough i kept on pacing around and for me, the best thing to do at the end of that um, is to reflect and to say, right, I've did this presentation and it, did, it didn't work out because of these things. So next time I do a presentation, let's work on one of those things. Let's work on making sure I'm projecting my voice properly. Let's work on making sure that I'm actually making eye contact with every single person in the room during the course of the presentation. Let's work on using simpler language or having a way for me to be able to remember the information um, so that I don't forget it, so that I'm not stumbling over my words. And the more presentations you do, the more talks you do, the better you refine that process. So then by the time you have been doing it for, for a while, you've got to the point where actually you've, you're pretty good at it. And with everything, you know, the old adage, practice makes perfect, I think just, just speaks huge volumes in that circumstance. Whatever it is that you do, you practice it and you get better. I thought, I can't believe I'm going to do massage. I'm going to be rubbish at massage. I don't know anything about massage. And I'd, one of the um, 
I had to go for what's called a trade test and a trade test is where you go and look at um you go in and you go into a room and you have to show how good you are at massage and so i'm in this i'm i'm there with um i've, I've just been training for what, a month and i was there with people who have been doing it for years and i was freaking out of my mind nick like i was just having an absolute melt oh my goodness i don't know what i'm meant to be in. and you know they say okay so how would you start the conversation with the client how would you make them feel at ease i think i haven't done any of this like i've not had any experience at all of any of this i don't know what i'm going to do but i just thought to myself look just calm down relax you've got this just be yourself boom 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 positive 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 and it went really well and there were people there who went who'd gone in before me who'd been a massage therapist for seven eight nine ten years and they'd come out and be like oh no we failed and then that's even worse for you when you're new at something and there's someone who's already experienced at it and they go to do it before you and they fail that just makes you feel like there's no way i'm gonna be able to do this if someone who's who's actually got more experience than me can't do it why would i be able to do this like you said about um, getting on the radio that is. i always feel the opposite <coughs> way if somebody's come out and they've had a negative experience although it sounds bad it, <laughs> it makes you love me, it. <laughs> I don't love it but it makes me feel better because suddenly I, I my confidence isn't the worst in the room you know like i had an experience i was trained well i did the women's training day to be a firefighter when i first went self-employed i thought well i need a backup plan you know just in case it all goes wrong so i'll try and get into the fire brigade and they weren't recruiting but they did these training days for women because they needed um they only had more more males basically in the fire brigade so they had these women training days and i was scared of everything because i'm a little bit scared of heights i'm a little bit scared of being claustrophobic and <laughs> just scared of everything great for being a fireman yeah. <laughs> so i was sitting there in the in the um waiting room talking to the other people some of them had been on this day before and they everyone was seemed so confident they were like, oh the ladder thing yeah i'll be fine with the ladder and already i was building up my nerves to be the worst in the room and i actually felt like i want to leave that's when i know i'm totally yeah. in my comfort zone when that exit is like yeah. screaming at me you need to go yeah. toilet <laughs> yes. yes you need to go home and collect yeah. something <laughs> yeah 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 and all of these things it's just your sub it's your conscious mind isn't it getting getting in in the way and escaping you from fear because mm -hmm. you don't want to be put in that fearful yeah. situation. But what happened was all of these confident people were in front of me in the queue ready to go up this ladder. And it's the h biggest ladder that they use in the UK. And you've got to climb all the way to the top, hook your leg around and then let go with your arms and look down at the floor. <laughs> so you are all safetyed up. You know, you're not going to fall or anything. But obviously you get, it's like they're walking on the fire. You feel like you're going to be yeah. hurt even though you're not. Um, and these, the people who were more confident than me were going up towards the ladder. Everybody was doing it fine. And the one lady right in front of me, she stopped. And she was like, I can't do this. And suddenly all of her confidence left. It was as if it came to, <laughs> to me. <laughs> I'll tell you that, thank you. I didn't feel amazing <laughs> that she couldn't do it. But as she walked away, I just suddenly, I just took a deep yeah. breath. And it was as if all of my fear just went. And I just mm -hmm. looked forward and took one step at a time, didn't look down and just kept going. And I was like, suddenly I was at the top. Mm -hmm. and i couldn't believe that that happened to me so i don't know if that would happen in all other situations but okay so do let me ask you this then um do you think that if you know you just started as a personal trainer and you had to go and do a trade test because you wanted to go and work at a big famous gym and they had the boss's gym and the boss's gym was like right um each of you gets 15 minutes i want you to take me through a very simple routine and explain to me what what you're going to do explain to me how it's going to help me um, make me feel at ease, etc., etc. That's it, okay? And then you're, let's say, fifth in line. And you're talking to the people in front of you, and the people in front of you said, Oh, yeah, I've been a personal trainer for 20 years. I've worked here, I've worked here, I've run my own business, I've done this, I've done that. Oh, I know all of these techniques from personal training. I, I know this. I've trained with like professional athletes. They go in, and then they come out, and they're like, He's, he's, he's said it. I, I didn't know what I was talking about. He's, he's, he said I failed. He said I'm, I'm not able to work here. Mm, yeah. If you just start out as a personal trainer, how would you? How would I'm you feel? I'm starting to see your point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe it's Going different to the ladder, but in some ways, yeah, the same. But I know what. Yeah, I do know what you mean in terms of if someone else can't do something, it almost bolsters your confidence to be able to do it. If if fire walking, for example, because it wasn't a case of actual knowledge and education yeah. it was a case of somebody's yeah. allowing their fears to get in the way yeah and they're not doing it therefore it's just a case of mind and, and now i can do it yeah maybe yeah. that's what it was yeah 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 exactly i think if it's the fire walking and you're kind of thinking i need to walk on fire and then you um 
if someone else in front of you can't do it you're like i'll just i'll just do it and you go on and and you just kind of get the confidence mm. from them but at the same time where i said to you before about the firewalk i had an experience at tough mudder and in that it's an obstacle course for those of you that don't know and you it's basically a fitness obstacle course but um, in between the running there's obstacles where you might get hurt and one of them was electrocution <laughs> what so you're crawling on the floor in the water Oof. as well and you've got these wires coming down and some of them are um live and some no. of them are oh no so you can see the people in front of you crawling underneath and i saw one guy get hit in the head <laughs> oh, no. screamed and then his head landed in the water like he was dead I thought, <laughs> God, I'm so scared to go in there. But then there was other people going in, they seemed to be okay. So I thought, well, I'll follow their way. Um, and well, before that, though, I, I was really, really hesitant to go in after seeing that guy and thinking this is going to be excruciatingly painful. I'm really scared to go in. But because it was queues of people, there was those person in front of you, you kind of had to go in because there was someone behind you. There was yeah, no stopping. Yeah. So that pushed me to go in. I couldn't listen to my fear. Yeah. I just had to do it. That's. Uh, did you get hit by? I did. I, got, I thought I'd managed to oh, no. get past all of them, and as my head was getting out the oh, other end, no. thinking I was safe, my calf got oh. hit with one, and it was like a cramp times ten. Oh no! But really so quickly, bad. and then it was gone. But oh. I, I can't imagine getting hit in the head like that, man. Did. <laughs> saying that actually at the very end of the race there's um, a standing up one that you have to run through and jump over some haystacks in the middle yeah. and you've got the wires coming down some live some not I was scared by then obviously because I'd been hit by the ones before yeah. thinking this is going to hurt and so I had two guys with me it was my self defence team it was mostly guys and I had one on each arm but then I realised as that we were going to run through because they were like oh we'll hold you so you won't be able to stop as we go through I realised they were both holding their heads so yeah, one and, one. <laughs> and I'm right in the middle wide open <laughs> to get electric <laughs> by everything <laughs> so I think actually I think I did get shocked because I kind of blacked out in that moment but then before I knew it I was out the other side <laughs> also if you're all linked together if one person gets shocked doesn't it does it not go through the others or did you not feel it i don't think it's that strong okay okay yeah there is a certain good. voltage i can't remember what it is and i remember like googling like mad how bad yeah. is this voltage yeah, <laughs> yeah cause, before doing the race because electric fences they they pulse don't they do they yeah i remember as a kid so i grew up in norfolk <laughs> and if you find an electric fence you play a game where you have to don't play this game anybody but you had to grab <laughs> the fence and then release it and if you you could do it so that you could avoid the pulse of the electricity um, until obviously you kind of got out of sync and then you got an electric shock. These which are the games they played in Norfolk. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we played those down here. <laughs> <laughs> so, where were we? So, where were we? We were talking about um, giving talks and presenting. And um, sometimes when it doesn't go right. Oh, yeah, right. and sometimes when it doesn't go right. Yeah, so I think, for example, if you were feeling that you weren't confident enough to do something, you then go into the experience and if they the feedback was actually that wasn't good oh, yeah. you then feel like it's because I wasn't confident and you reinforce your belief that you weren't confident and next time you go to an experience you again think you're not confident and you can keep making it a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. yeah and the worst thing is if it's with, if it's with the same group of people or same person so you'll do something and they'll say to you oh, that was that wasn't very good um, you didn't do this 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 and this and this and we want you to come back next week and do it again and you, you kind of think, I can't. I, I've got to try to remember to do everything that they said, but I'm going to go back in. And they've already got this perception of me as as not being very good. How can you change that somebody's perception of you not being very good by being good? Obviously, mm -hmm. but how do you get yourself mentally to that point where you you think actually I am really good at at presenting um, when you weren't in the first place? You know, if you go in somewhere and you give it your all and you find that giving your all hasn't been successful, you probably haven't given your all in the first place, but you then need to look at what it is that you need to do to try to, to make sure you don't make that mistake again, which I think is, is really tough to do. And I think for a lot of people, like you said, with the old, oh, someone's calling or got to go out, got to go nip home or I'm feeling a bit ill or let me just nip to the toilet. You make all these excuses in your mind so you don't have to engage with things that make you feel like you're out of your comfort zone. And now, for me, if there's something and I feel like, actually, I'm feeling out of my comfort zone, that's almost a trigger for me to then do it. Because that's, that's me... Me too. ...pushing, pushing myself to, to improve. 
I've never done a, a radio interview for. Oh, I've got this interview. I why have Take I agreed to do it? <laughs> yeah, why should I come to it? Well, no, go go and do it because it's the only way you're going to be able to get any experience at, at doing this sort of stuff. And there are people in this world who go and do a absolutely anything and everything they possibly can that they don't want to do. You know, people that are yeah. scared of heights. It's a hundred days of fear. If you watch that, no, what's There's that? The lady on YouTube. She does a hundred days oh, of fear. Oh my goodness, she's brilliant. And she, you know, things like dancing in public, yeah, for no reason, just putting a bit of music, yeah. and you're the only person oh. dancing. I'd love to do something like that. That's a good. She does that. She she does like crazy stuff, like jumping from a plane. I don't think I could do that, or not yet. Let's do it. Let's I'd do a hundred days of fear. My way up. <laughs> but yeah, I think yeah, definitely a hundred days of getting out your comfort zone. Let's do it. Perfect. Watch out for this and YouTube channel. And eventually, yeah, I'm going to get over my fear of spiders and things like that as well. But I'm going to use the NLP for that. It's yeah. really powerful how the NLP can help with those. The other thing, yeah, the NLP is amazing for that, isn't it? The other thing for that is just constant exposure. That's the other way to get over things like fear of spiders. Yeah. If you just around. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I have in my bag here. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we've got <laughs> 10 minutes left. And before you go, I'd like to hear some um, tips of the day. Is it tips of the day? Facts of the day. Facts of the day. Back to the from day. the YouTube channel. Um, so my fa one of my favourite ones is um, is one of my first. So this this all originated from me when I was a teacher and thinking, you know, you go into a classroom and you've got a group for the kids and you basically just churn out the exam syllabus so they can take their exams at the end of the year. And me not really loving the fact that that's what had become this state of education. So I wanted to have like a little top tip, a little fact, fact of the day that I could give kids every single day. Mm -hmm. So one of my favourite ones is if you add up, and you know, with these facts, you kind of build it up, especially if there's, there's not a great deal of substance. If you add up all of the grains of sand on the entire planet, so all of the beaches, all of the deserts, at the bottom of all of the oceans, all of the sandstone buildings, all those tiny, tiny grains of sand, add them all up together completely, there's still more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on Earth, which lit just blows my mind. If you think of a handful of sand, there's thousands and thousands, millions, billions and billions of sand grains of sand on the planet and there's still more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on earth i love that fact that's wow. that's probably <laughs> one of my favorite facts um and i saw that the very recent video as well you were talking about the solar eclipse oh yes oh my goodness that. Well, that happened yesterday. so good so um so yeah yesterday there was a total solar eclipse in america and this went from this went from Oregon all the way through to South Carolina, and the path of totality is 70 miles wide. So, path of totality is oh hello, path of totality is basically where a, a solar eclipse is where you have the Earth and then you have the Moon, and then you have the Sun. So, the disc shape of the Moon as it travels past the Earth in front of the Sun is exactly the same size as the size of the Sun relative to where it is in position. So it blocks out the entire circumference of the sun. So that is a total eclipse. And this total eclipse went across America. It's called the Great American Eclipse. So you could be standing in Oregon, for example, and for two and a half minutes, the moon blocks out the sun completely. And all you can see is the edge of the sun, which is the, called the corona, the atmosphere around the edge where you've got all these solar flares and you've got this, um, these mag this lots of magnetic activity going on and these things only occur if you're standing on one position on earth it only occurs every hundred or every few hundred years the next one in the uk is not going to be until or um september the 23rd 2090 so we've got a long time to wait for then 2090 2090 yes 19 no 20 no 2090 <laughs> <laughs> 90 um so therefore the next one you can go to i think is in south america and i think that is in 20 19 it's either 2018 or 2019 in south america but if you want to see a total solar eclipse they're amazing simply because it all goes dark birds go a little bit crazy they don't know what's going on because it's dark so they start singing their nighttime songs animals go and start screaming you get a lot of um the temperature drops because obviously we're getting a lot of heat from the sun so the temperature completely drops it goes very cold for those really for eerie. those two yeah it's incredibly yeah. eerie incredibly eerie experience 
So that's a total solar eclipse. Amazing. Thank you. So that'll be why everybody in America just had to cancel all their appointments and yes. make sure they, they were they yes, were there for it. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's why millions of people. And Google are doing a big, huge video, which is going to be an hour and a half long video, of the entire eclipse as it travels across America. So they're getting people to take photos of the total eclipse and they're going to put them all together into this video, which is going to be awesome. That's going to be brilliant. Yeah. So tell us, where can we find your YouTube channel? What's it called? How can people... Um, follow you on social media so um i am it's, it's just my name pretty much for everything so that's mark lotsu um i am on youtube as mark lotsu m-a-r-k-l-o-t-s-u and that's got my fact of the days and also got another um sort of playlist on there called real talk where i just talk about um different topics different things that have, that have come up in my life on a week do by week basis um i don't do interviews but i will do they <laughs> Why is our main radio show on there? <laughs> um, and then on Facebook, Mark Lotsu, um, at Mark Lotsu Life. And Twitter, at Mark Lotsu Life. And Instagram, uh, Mark Lotsu. It's either going to be on any social media, either my name, Mark Lotsu, or at Mark Lotsu Life. And that's where you can find me. Brilliant. I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on the show today. And thank you for allowing me to Snapchat every now and then and not put you on the tracks. <laughs> Um, is there Not anything else you'd like to say before we close up? Um, thank you very much. Uh, this, this is one of those situations where it's a completely random meeting of two people, but I feel like it's it was something that was, that was put on the cards for us to do, um, and I've really, really enjoyed my time here. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, we're going to play some music now, and then we'll be back. Actually, I'm not here next week, but I will be here the week after with another guest. So please make sure you tune back in. 91.8 Hayes FM, the Fustal Fit Health and Fitness Show. If you didn't manage to check out this whole show and you'd like to hear more, I will be uploading it to my podcast, which is on iTunes, also called Fustal Fit Health and Fitness Show. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave Nicola a review on iTunes. You can also check out the show notes and get other free content on her website, fustalfit.co.uk. If you'd like to contact Nicola, email nicola at fustalfit.co.uk.